<laughs> okay. I can, All right. Hopefully, this is recording. Can you give me the meeting ID and I can use your computer? Oh, yeah. By the way, it's got a presenter for it. Oh, there it is. 173. 729. 779. Then be ready to mute because we're going to get some. Sweet, sweet feedback. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? No, Check, I test. Can't you, you can't hear me. Gosh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Try try Hello? Hello? Yeah? yeah. Ooh. Can you mute yourself? Thank you. <laughs> All right. I think we're in good shape. Um, and we are, rec yeah, it says it's recording. Perfect. So, yeah, when we're done, we can just crop the yeah. beginning. Make it more professional. <laughs> professional? Just... We're going for professional. <laughs> Excellent. Semi competent, Dave. All right. <laughs> that's, 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 a that. <laughs> that's a bar I can that's a bar I can adhere to. <laughs> okay. No, no. We'll we'll be very professional. <clears throat> Actually I can. Yes, okay, maybe I can't promise. Oh, that. I see. Nice yeah. <laughs> It took me a while. I was like, it looks like Halloween colors. <laughs> slowly my brain works. I didn't think about the I didn't think about the color scheme actually. Really? So, yeah. It's just like subliminal. Very <laughs> <laughs> okay. good. Oh no, actually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just one of those things where someone's like, you're a Harry Potter fan? So, I read the books. <laughs> what more do I have to do? Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't read the recent book, so. Um, just, the, like, that just, just the canon. Just oh, the canon. <laughs> so much stuff, dude. <laughs> yep. And now it's all canon by the time we're done. <laughs> <clears throat> In fact, we can pause the recording. All right, it's five after. Let's let's go ahead. So um, we're going to continue uh, the class and talk about hyperpolarized chemistry. Um, so this is switching gears a little bit, though not so much. Um, we talked a little bit about some of the, the mechanisms of polarization last time in uh, Jeremy's presentation. Um, now we're just gonna talk a little more about the nitty gritty about how do you actually prepare compounds for hyperpolarized carbon. Um, we've certainly seen a lot about that stuff about the about the techniques, um, and I mean, very, very excitingly, it allows us to look at chemical kinetics uh, in real time, uh, potentially in vivo. Um, but there's still there's still groundwork to be done in order to get to that point, and a lot of it starts with the chemistry. Um, and so we're going to talk a lot about that. That's enough of an introduction. Oh yeah, and uh, I don't know. This is almost a little bit like potions class, I suppose. I'm, that's not me, but <clears throat> okay. For some reason, uh, uh oh, something doesn't look so hot here. Um, anyway, uh, so we'll try to recreate what we have on this <laughs> on this slide. Um, basically, we're going to talk about what are what are the what are the the aspects of a good hyperpolarized compound. What makes things polarize very well? What makes some things not polarize very well? What makes things usable, not usable? 
we're going to talk then about, okay, so if you have a new compound, how do you, how do you figure out how to best prepare it for, for a hyperpolarized experiment? How do you get, get the best uh, polarization out of it? We're also going to talk a little bit about, um, I guess what you could call quality assurance or you know, QA, QC, um, where you can also assess how, how your compound's doing and you know, get, get an idea of how well it will work when you actually go in vivo. You know, we have to take steps here and start, you know, if it doesn't work well in vitro, it's not gonna fly in vivo. And then the final thing is we're gonna try to talk a little bit about um, uh, sort of different ways that the field has been going in the past, maybe five, 10 years or so, and you know, some of the sort of newer and maybe not so new, um, you know, tricks and tips, you know, of what people have been trying for, for polarizing compounds. Okay. Hopefully all the rest of these will work fine. Um, I want to start just with a short discussion on, I guess what you could call the pivotal players of hyperpolarized carbon. Um, so you can shout this out. If, if there's one compound that polarizes better and is used in more applications than any other, what would it be? You can just shout it out. <laughs> Don't everybody go at once. <laughs> pyruvate. There we go. Yes, pyruvate. Pyruvate is a... It's a fantastic molecule. Um, and of course, as Jeremy discussed last time and Renuka, we can look at glycolysis. We could see preferential conversion to lactate or alanine. We can also see CO2 liberated when it goes into the citric acid cycle. It's a, it's a great compound. Uh, another, another pivotal player, at least that I've named, at least for UCSF that is used very widely is uh, urea. We use this for perfusion. Uh, it, basically doesn't react. So you see where it goes and it works well as a perfusion agent. In fact, the two of these together work really nicely so that you can kind of correct for perfusion. Um, you know, can correct your, your, your glycolytic data based on, on the perfusion in a given voxel. So I need not go into this too much, but there are all kinds of examples looking at it in the context of prostate cancer in various models. Um, looking also at the brain, looking at, uh, the treatment response uh, via changes in glycolysis. And then on the perfusion side, you can get some really pretty images um, with uh, C15 urea and some, some fun pulse sequences like the SSFP. That's fantastic. And I think there's one more in here as well. Um, oh yeah, that's, so that's, that's pyruvate in the, in the heart as well. So, so applications abound. The big question is both of these compounds, one of the things that enables them, well, Actually, let's let's go more general. What makes these agents very good? Um, and so that's what we're going to focus on in the next slide here. Okay, so if we have to name all the properties of what what's a good hyperpolarized agent, we can sort them into two categories. One is biological, and the other is chemical. These are both very very important. And if you have don't you know if you don't have one or the other, you're going to be in serious trouble, and you may have to maybe get clever or <laughs> rethink everything entirely. So on the biological side of things, uh, we can name a few. First of all, biologically relevant. Um, and we, we certainly don't wanna, I mean, we're, we're very interested in metabolism and looking at changes in metabolism. If it, if it doesn't report on a, a, uh, an enzymatic process or a physiologic process or a biological process that is useful and important, particularly in a disease context, we're wasting our time. Yeah. So, so this should be the first question that you ask for any compound. <laughs> what, what's it going to show me biologically? Or what do I think it's going to show? Next is, it has to be quick. We've talked about T1s a little bit. You know that the signal we get in hyperpolarized is transient. That means that all the processes that happen between your agent and being injected and it getting to the target of interest to be converted, uh, those have to be pretty quickly if it gets converted. Um, in the case of a perfusion agent, it doesn't, which is why I, I like to joke, if anything, you know, doesn't show any extra peaks, you know, in vivo, when you inject it, you found another great perfusion agent. Um, now, this is another big one, uh, particularly if you're thinking along the lines of other uh, molecular imaging techniques. Um, the concentrations that we inject, uh, this is in mice and in humans, this is on a very high scale. Um, when you're talking about PET, positron emission tomography, you're talking about injecting things at more like nanomolar concentrations. Um, 
very small amounts, um, which means that you can inject things like, for example, nerve agents, which in fact they're doing at China Basin. They're injecting very small quantities of nerve, nerve agents, you know, to look at receptor binding. They can do it because they're hardly injecting anything, you know. <laughs> Even still, they have to be careful with it, but, you know, that's something we could never hyperpolarize <laughs> a nerve agent. It would be, uh, it would be, it would be terrible. Um, yeah, so polarizing and, what's that? I'll stay on the lab. <laughs> yeah. Well, polarizing a nerve agent as a precursor to another agent is another story. Uh, you can ask me about that later. That's a fun story. Um, okay, moving on to the chemical side of things. As we've seen, T1 is one of the most important, I'm going to say chemical properties, uh, mainly because the T1 of the nucleus is mainly dictated by the chemical environment. That, that involves everything else that it's bound to, and very much to an extent, it depends on also what's in the solution with it. Um, so, you know, the T1 varies with a lot of things. We know it varies with field strength. It can also vary with other physiologic, biologic parameters as well. Um, and so, at least we have to have a good starting point. You know, if, if, if we just put it in solution, um, and it has a bad T1, which I would say is, you know, less than 30 seconds. You could be generous, maybe less than 20. Not so great. This also depends on what your application is. If it's in vivo, I would say, you know, you want to start with something 30 seconds or so. If you're going for like an in vitro measurement, well, you know, maybe you're not so stringent. Um, okay. The chemical shift upon conversion is a big one. If this thing gets converted, but... It, it ends up as a peak that is very close to your parent compound, you're going to be in huge trouble. Um, generally speaking, the, the, the converted compound that we see is much smaller in magnitude than the parent compound. You inject a ton of pyruvate and you see a lactate peak, generally speaking, that's smaller. Um, which means that if, it's, if, if, a, if a peak is very close, if, if peaks are close together, you're not going to be able to quantify them very well. And that really hurts you. We're trying to be quantitative with our molecular imaging here. The next one is a, a high liquid concentration. Now, this is when you formulate it. Um, this enables a couple things. I'll go more into detail uh, in, a, in a later slide. But um, the, the, the more concentrated you can get this thing for polarization, generally, the better off you are. Uh, and one last thing is chemical stability. Um, this actually goes hand in hand with the liquid concentration, with the concentration of the prep. Because um, generally, the more concentrated something is, the more likely it is to bump into other molecules, and therefore, the more chemically reactive it is. So this is also a consideration to make. Um, and will very much, and can dictate you know, what, your, what your prep looks like at the end. Okay, I have another column here, which I call why pyruvate acid, why pyruvic acid nails it. And it's, if you're, if you're ever trying to develop another compound, this column gets sort of depressing because you find out how much pyruvic acid has going for it. And one by one, you can find how little your compound of your favorite compound has, <laughs> working, you know, how much is working against it. Okay. Pyruvic acid. Why is it biologically relevant? It measures glycolysis. Every cell in your body is doing glycolysis. This is very important. So it's a, it's a ubiquitous thing. If you look at PET, What's the, most, um, what, what's, what's the most used PET compound, positron emission tomography? Does anybody know? FDG, what does FDG stand for? Yes, fluorodiacetyl glucose. I don't think it's a coincidence that both PET and hyperpolarized carbon, their, their top compound is, it's a sugar or a sugar derivative. <laughs> so glycolysis is very important in the context of disease. The next thing, rapid conversion. Pyruvate, pyruvate, when it goes in, it's taken up preferentially by MCT1, that's the cellular transporter, and it gets in pretty quickly. Um, and then we see it also converted in the cytosol generally. It doesn't need to go to the mitochondrion if you want to see lactate. So that's pretty quick. That's a big thing. Um, next, uh, as far as tolerability, we've, we've demonstrated in our phase one clinical trials at UCSF that you can go up to 230 millimolar. Uh, pyruvate, and you don't see adverse effects. I'm not sure if we went higher than that, but... Um, no, 230, 250. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly, you know, the, 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 the number of millimoles that you inject is important, too, and how fast, but, but anyway, so it's, it's very tolerable. It's not a big deal. Um, okay, on the chemical side, 
C1 labeled well, pyruvic acid, um, it's T1 is, it's about 60 seconds. And I put that at three Teslas. That's, that's pretty good, you know? So, so you know, if, if you have that T1 in three minutes, you know, most of your signal's gone. That's great. That gives us a lot of time to see the conversion we want to see. Next, uh, the chemical shift difference. Pyruvate is at uh, 171, lactate's at 183 ppm. So you can very clearly separate those. Um, that 12 ppm turns out to be, what is it, about 300 hertz on a three Tesla magnet or more than that, right? 400? Okay, I was rounding. 400 hertz. So um, that's, that's not, not a problem. You know, you can get good enough shims for that and you can resolve the peaks. Great. Now, neat pyruvic acid, that's what, we, that's what we polarize with the radical in it, of course. That stuff's at 14.4 molar. It's super concentrated. Um, so, so it you know, nails that one. And then generally it's stable. Actually, interestingly, you can see um, some very small peaks in your hyperpolarized uh, pyruvate dissolution. You, know, you do have some, some, some contaminants or byproducts and things. It's not perfectly stable per se. However, um, you know, it, it's nothing that's of, of serious concern. Um, you know, it's <laughs> the vast majority of it's pyruvate when it comes out of the polarizer. So, so there you go. <laughs> pyruvate is, uh, you, you couldn't come up with anything better, I don't think. Um, okay, so, but we're going to focus primarily on the chemical side of things. You know, so from, from this point on, we're going to say you've got a compound and you're, you're sure that all the bio, it's going to check all the, all the biology check boxes. Um, we're going to talk more about what's behind the chemical side of this. Just to review, DDNP, um, remember you've got your, um, your you, you saw that cup last time during the demo, you have that, that green liquid in it. This is, if you could zoom in on the liquid and get into the sort of more atomic level, you'd see something highly simplified, well, that would highly simplify to this. You'd see a bunch of C13 nuclei, of course, contained within compounds. And then you would have these lone electrons that are on these, these radical species. And they're all in a glassy matrix. We're going to talk more about that um, at a B naught of, uh, you know, 3.35 Tesla. If it's a hypersense polarizer, the temperature is about 1.4 Kelvin. It gets colder on the spin lab polarizers. Again, highly simplified. As we saw last time, just by cooling things down, the electrons get super polarized. So, you know, they're all pointing in the same direction. That's great. Um, so then what we can do is by applying a microwave tuned to the transition frequency, we can uh, transfer that polarization from the electrons to our carbon nuclei. Importantly, the protons also get polarized by this um, to an extent. In fact, actually, I think generally, it's generally accepted they get polarized to about 100% from the electrons. Uh, but the carbons get polarized too. We rapidly dissolve it, out comes our, our, our green liquid, and off we run to our, our mouse or you know, biological system, our favorite biological system. Okay, let's focus more on what we have in the frozen uh, in the frozen sample inside the polarizer as it's polarizing. Um, and again, this is a bit of reiteration: the hyperpolarization. Hey, look, it's pyruvate or pyruvic acid. And of course, C thirteen enriched. Right? Um, why do we need to C thirteen enrich our compounds? Do you remember? First of all, what does C thirteen enriched mean? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone remember how, I guess to use the word, how usual carbon 12 is? Can you put a number to it? 99%, exactly. Good. So, so by C13 enriching, you've enhanced your signal by, by a factor of 100, essentially. So, so very good. That's good. There's the HP agent. Um, now, we also have, as we saw, a stable radical. That's what the structure looks like. This is what's known as a trital radical. There are other flavors of radical. Um, and then even the same radical you can tune chemically. We'll see that in a second here um, to modify its chemical properties. Um, the lone electron is the important part. That's what gets polarized when it cools down, and that's the source of our polarization that we transfer to the carbon. Great. Now, this is a glass at at this very cold temperature. This is a very important point. What that means is that 
you have a, a homogeneous distribution of all components within the formulation. Which means that you know you don't have so you don't have crystal structure. You don't have any sort of regularity. You know it's just it's just it's it's amorphous is the other word we can use for it. That ensures that the carbons and the electrons are distributed evenly throughout. Um, if that's not the case, and say you have sort of segregation of the electrons over in one corner and the C13s in another corner, you know you're not going to be able to transfer your your polarization. This polarization transfer is a very distance dependent process. So you want your C13s basically you know, surrounding your, your electrons, um, more or less what's being shown in this picture. Now, a couple other things that we can pull apart here. One is a solvent. Um, you know, that's what dissolves it when it's in a liquid state. Um, and again, we want the agent to be for a high concentration generally. We'll talk more about that. Another thing you might have in here is what's known as a glassing agent. As I mentioned, crystallization is a big enemy of ours uh, because that can exclude the radical or exclude the C13 and sort of kind of basically preferentially, you know, hang out with, you know, one or the other. Um, so a glassing agent is something that it disrupts crystallization and it helps us to get this glass. Um, Actually, one of the fun things about this is it's the same thinking. If it, does anyone here do cell culture? It's almost the same thing um, as in cell culture. When you you know if you've ever frozen down a stock of cells, you want to you want to use a glassing agent. Usually, it's DMSO, right? The purpose of that glassing agent is to prevent crystal formation. Um, another actually fun place where you see glassing agents used is in actually ice cream manufacture. And so, you know, coming up with good glassing agents makes your ice cream, I think it actually makes it more creamy <laughs> as opposed to, you know, icy and kind of disgusting. So, um, but, you know, to each, to each their own. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, so I, I say this just to point out that there's literature on glassing agents that extends beyond hyperpolar. It's actually the other place is EPR because, um, I'm sorry, electron paramagnetic resonance, because elect that sort of stuff is done typically in frozen samples. Anyway, that's enough on that. The last thing that we may add is an, an electron relaxation agent, which improves the polarization. This is something that Jeremy alluded to last time. We'll review it briefly in a, another uh, slide. Okay, let's go through each of these. Here's the radical. This is the one we typically use, trital radical. Um, so that electron is delocalized over the ring structure. Um, so you can you know, kind of pencil push and sort of, you know, create and form new um, double bonds on this thing. Um, so that essentially confers stability. Lone electrons, generally electrons hate being alone. Uh, they like to be paired up. Um, so the only way that you're going to get this thing to be stable is if it's delocalized and it has a large area basically to kind of spread itself over upon. So, so that's where this thing's fairly stable. Uh, now, this is the important thing about these trital radicals is that you notice that there are these R's on the ends. By changing the R groups, you change the solubility of the radical. This is very important because depending on what you've mixed together, what solvent works well for your compound, you're going to want to tune your radical as much as possible to that. There are two, I think, of, of important uh, two of note worth considering or uh, worth mentioning. One is what's known as the OX63 radical. It has these, um, these hydroxyl groups on the ends. That's the top one. It's the most hydrophilic. So most water preps or water glycerol preps uh, use OX63. The middle one is what they call GE trial. It has this other alternative name. Uh, it has methoxy groups, which makes it a little uh, more hydrophobic or less hydrophilic. This is the one that we mix with our pyruvate, and this is the one that's clinically, pyruvic acid, I should say. Um, and this is clinically approved um, you know, for use for the hyperpolarized compounds. So, uh, well, for, for, for pyruvic acid. Um, so anyway, and then Finland, people usually don't use the Finland radical. It's not very hydrophilic. And most biological compounds of interest for hyperpolarized are hydrophilic. So, um, so anyway, uh, so that's that. Um, now the typical uh, thing, or sorry, the, the, the typical concentration for here is 15 to 20 millimolar. As Jeremy alluded to last time, there's a sweet spot. This is very much a Goldilocks kind of thing. Because the radical is both a polarization source 
It's also a relaxation pathway um, for the C13 nuclei. So, so, so it helps, uh, it, it, it helps, but it also hurts. So that's why there's, a, there's an optimum. What's important to note is that you can, you can get a general sense of your radical concentration by looking at the buildup in the polarizer. Uh, especially, you know, having a having a, a reference, you know, so if you know what the radical concentration should be. Anyway, if you have too little radical, you typically see a slower buildup and you see, well, you see, a, yeah, you should see a lower max signal. If you have too much radical, you see a very fast buildup. Um, and typically, you, see, you also see that lower max signal too. So, um, great, the solvent. These are the typical solvents that we use, water, glycerol, Dimethyl acetamide, uh, dimethyl sulfoxide, you'll recognize again. So these are, these are pretty common ones. Um, they need to be non-toxic. And that's, I say somewhat, because they do get diluted when you, when you do the dissolution, right? Um, you, know, you might add maybe, you know, at least for pyruvate, you, you, you use 24 microliters of pyruvic acid. You dissolve with 4,300 microliters of, uh, of volume. So that's a but I think that's over a hundred fold dilution. So that helps very much. Um, now, the other thing too is this is, I bring this up, you know, that there, there are other options you might be able to use for solvents. It all depends on what your compound is. Um, but, you know, there may be other things that you could use. We've actually very often talked about whether ethanol would be an acceptable solvent for a compound, um, especially looking towards clinical. I mean, you know, ethanol, it's, well, you know, we, we know it's, it's not the most toxic thing in the world. Um, I certainly injecting it into your blood, you know, you might have some fun effects with your patients afterwards, but at the same time, if it dissolves your hyperpolarized, or your, your compound for hyperpolarization, it, you know, well, maybe they, they can stand being a little woozy after the hyperpolarized shot. <laughs> they might even want more. <laughs> anyway, um, continuing on. The glassing agent. You'll notice actually something kind of fun. There's a lot of overlap between these slides. Uh, as we mentioned, DMSO is used uh, even in cell culture as a glassing agent when you freeze down cells. Glycerol, same. Dimethyl acetamide also in, um, confers some glassing ability. Again, this is also, you know, an open field, and there are other compounds that may work well as glassing agents. At some point, I was playing around with sugars, actually inspired by this, you know, all this ice cream research. Um, didn't go very far, but you're welcome to try some of these. Um, I mean, there's a whole, whole body of literature on this stuff. Um, is that trails? Is that liquid at room temperature? No, 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 no. It's it is it's solid. It's it's solid. Okay. Um, Added to it. Yeah, but is you're essentially polarizing in syrup. Think of it that way. Um, so uh, anyway, um, so as we mentioned, you know, there's overlap here. The solvents will often disrupt crystal formation, um, especially if you're putting in two things that you know have different. You know, solubilities, something hydrophobic and hydrophilic, or combinations thereof. Um, these are these are good ways of disrupting any crystal formation. Um, now, the other important thing is, you know, just looking at you know your 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 formulation. If it's more viscous, it'll tend to glass better. That makes sense, right? If you cool something rapidly, the molecules are you know they're they're quickly moving around well as quickly as they can to try and form a crystal structure. But if they're, you know, very viscous, slow moving, they're not going to be able to assume any sort of crystal formation in time as you freeze. Um, so things like glycerol or glycerol is in particular is a great glassing agent. Um, and, and if you just look at it, it's super viscous. It's hard to work with, in fact. So, um, and that's mainly because of those, those, uh, those, um, those hydroxide groups. You get a lot of hydrogen bonding. And so, you know, so that, that in, parts a lot of viscosity there. Um, and again, you can combine these. One very common combination is glycerol water. You'll see a lot of those in, in, the, um, in the literature, glycerol water preps. Okay, we talked about glasses, you know, glassing stuff. How do you know? Um, we're gonna see after, <laughs> so, so that'll be fun. Um, okay, the electron relaxation agent. Um, you know, I sort of put this, what the heck, why do we want this? You know, I mean, I think Jeremy sort of spoiled it last time, but, um, <laughs> but, but this is, I, I think it's good to go over this because I think it helps to solidify some of the, some of the, um, you know, just some of the, um, what do you call it? Some of the sort of fundamental concepts. Okay. As we, as we know, we have a polarized electron and a non-polarized C13. 
when you're large simplification, microwave comes and it confers the polarization onto the C13. You could sort of think of it in that way. What's very important is that, to my understanding, a microwave doesn't care where, which direction the polarization goes. So a polarized C13 can actually, a uh, microwave can come and basically throw that polarization right back at the electron. It doesn't care. Uh, it will induce that transition in either direction. Um, so what that means is that, um, you know, once your, once your electron has passed on a polarization, if you will, you know, passed on a polarization, um, what that means is that T1 actually works to recover the polarization. Remember that these electrons, just in the cold state, they're 100%, if not close to 100%, polarized. That's the thermal equilibrium, which means that T1 will move the whole system of electrons back to that highly polarized state. It's very different from what we typically think of, right? We think of T1 as reducing our signal, at least in hyperpolarized. Conventional MRR, it's a little more like this, you know, where the signal's going back up, you know, polarization's increasing. So it all depends on where you are relative to equilibrium. That's the big question. T1 always works to bring you towards equilibrium. In our case, with frozen electrons, T1 is our friend because it brings us back to the highly polarized state. Hopefully that makes some sense. Which is why, if you have you know, a short T1 for your electron, short T1, um, and then a uh, you know, microwave source, then you're, you're, you're favoring the, the forward pathway, if you will, where polarization is going towards the C13 and not where the polarization is going back towards the electrons. This is what Jeremy showed last time, and I think it's sort of a, it's, it's an alternative way of thinking about it. Um, you know, if you have a short electron T1, you can think of it as pumping more water. I mean, I always think of it as like a pump. You know, the faster you pump it, think it, you know, short T1, faster pumping. Um, you know, so you get more water coming out of it. Um, but then, of course, this also depends on the T1 of the nucleus. So if the nucleus, if the nuclear T1 is too short, it's just going to lose that polarization anyway. I didn't draw it in my diagram on the right, but these are all the things. Um, so, so there you go. Short electron T1 is our friend here, but we also we don't want to shorten the C13 T1 as well. The good thing is that the electrons, they have a higher gyromagnetic ratio, which means they couple more strongly to things, which means that they're more, I believe, I hope that's not oversimplifying it, they're more preferentially relaxed by these um, by these, these relaxation agents. So, so anyway, this is important, not just in the prep, you know, so in a prep, you know, the formulation, there's a, another sort of Goldilocks of how much GAD to add. The other thing to consider though, is when you dissolve, that gadolinium can also work against you and shorten the T1 in the liquid state as well. And that is very much going to depend upon your dilutional ratio. So one thing you can do, for example, is you know you use 20 microliters of prep, dissolve in four mils, and be like, hey, you know my T1 looks great. You could up that to 80 microliters of prep, dissolve in the same four mils, and be like, what the heck? Why is my T1 you know a little bit shorter? Well, you used four times the prep and the same buffer. You've got four times the gadolinium in your so in your solution. That's why your your C13 T1 is shorter. So anyway, things to things to consider. Um, both these things are important. Okay. So uh, we talked, this is sort of reiterating some things, high concentrations, generally this leads to higher polarization. Um, though as we saw last time, this may not be the case. Um, uh, the, 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 the other thing I don't think you can argue against is that if you have a more concentrated prep, you can put less of it in the polarizer, dissolve with the same liquid and get you know, um, you know, a, a higher concentration, you know, so that works nicely. You can basically get higher concentrations when you dissolve. Um, so that's, so there's two reasons why that's important. Radical, uh, you have to be able to dissolve this radical up to 15 to 20 millimolar. Um, and if it's not soluble, it may compromise your polarization. When you, when you formulate your compound, it's actually good to have a good eye on it and watch, you can actually watch and see when you add your green colored uh, radical, watch and see what happens to it. If it still remains as clumps, that suggests it's not very soluble. If it is soluble, you actually start to see it, you know, almost turn like wispy, it almost turns into like a cloud, you know, as like shortly after adding it, you'll see it sort of, you know, kind of diffusing through. That's a very good sign that it's soluble. And that's not something that we'll demonstrate upstairs, um, especially because radicals are expensive, but 
And then of course, this is good glass. We'll talk about how to, how to verify that. Um, and then as I mentioned, the agent has to be stable at high concentration. Um, my favorite example for, for, for this is glutamine. Glutamine, just to back up even beyond the chemical, uh, has a very strong biological rationale. Um, you have glutamine addiction in many cancers, um, and being able to identify that phenotype, as I understand, would be very beneficial for a, you know, for a clinician. They can, you know, they can distinguish a glutamine addicted cancer from a non-glutamine addicted. Um, that's great. So glutamine is a very popular hyperpolarized compound. However, one of the biggest negatives it has working against it is that you can formulate it at good concentration, but the formulation that is out there, it's very unstable. It forms not only this sort of cyclic ring structure on the right called uh, pyroglutamate, even worse, it forms uh, glutamate, which is the exact compound that you want to measure in vivo or in vitro. Um, so when you do an injection and you see a glutamate peak, it's really terrible if you have to ask the question, did that glutamine come from my biological system? Did my cells make that? Or did I inject it with my glutamine? You know, so, so that's why agent stability is a very important thing to have a, a general, you know, to have a handle on. So is that an issue of just the high concentration of glutamine in your sample? Or is it like reacting with either the solvent or the glassing agent? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, it's a combination of the high concentration, but also in order to get the high concentration, you have to form the salt. Um, and so forming the glutamine salt makes it more reactive because then the pH of your, I'm pretty sure, yeah, the pH of your, um, of your, uh, yeah, yeah, it, the pH of your prep then becomes very alkaline. And so it promotes the, 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 the degradation of the glutamine. So, and this is tough. Uh, one way around that is to basically remove the, uh, the, the solvent, which is, which is water in this case. But, but by adding cesium, that could be a big problem because cesium is very toxic. So, um, but this is still, I mean, an open question. And, you know, getting some good chemistry minds on formulating glutamine, I think would be a huge, be a huge advance. I think you, you'd, you'd go very far with this. You'd be a, a hyperpolarized hero. I think. Uh, last thing is, uh, you know, this low toxicity, I should say, when you dissolve it. Okay, um, we're going to maybe go over this a little bit more when we get to the lab, but very briefly, you know, let's say that you have a new compound, you've done your biological research, you're like, this thing will make a huge splash if we can polarize it and measure its chemical conversion or this or that. Um, okay, how do you prep it? The, step, the first step is research. So you can, you know, a lot of this is educated guessing. So first, take a look at the chemical structure um, and look first of all, what are the functional groups? Um, what are the carbon 13, or what, what are the possible carbon 13 sites? Um, and the important things are, you know, try to identify C13 site, or sorry, carbons in the compound that are number one, not bound directly to a proton. Those will have, uh, th those, those will relax very quickly. Um, let me say a little more about that. That's why most of the C13 compounds we polarize, they're either, they're either ketones, shown you know, most to the left, they're carboxylic acids in the middle, like, like pyruvate, um, or the other one that's kind of sort of fun is, what's, uh, this is a quaternary carbon that you see over there. It's a carbon bound to four non-proton uh, non atoms. Um, those also have quite long T ones. Um, now, the other part of this, though, is the C13 you label, it has to be close to the site of, the, of conversion, i.e., you, know, you have to think about what it's going to be converted to um, and see what functional groups change. Does that make sense? So this is a question. Why, why would you want your C13 to be in a site close to you know, the part of the molecule that changes when it reacts? Why would that be important at all? Any thoughts? Let me go back for a second. Um, so here's glutamine. Um, I've labeled the C5. Um, and then you see glutamate. You also see the C5 labeled. Um, the, the only difference between glutamine and glutamate is right here. So this is glutamine. You have an NH2. This is glutamate. That NH2 turns into an OH. That's the only difference in the compound. So my question is, why 
why do why why can I why would I want to label this carbon uh, this yeah this uh, this carbon why couldn't I label this one does anyone have any ideas what would the problem be though kind of a subtle thing but it relates to a point one of the important uh, one of the important criteria that we mentioned at the beginning of the, the lecture chemical shift yes so why why would the chemical shift be different on this carbon as opposed to this carbon? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So, so this is the thing. You know, uh, the the, the C thirteen here. Remember, so for for NMR, chemical shift depends on the the local electronic environment. Essentially, most of the change in, in chemical shift is based on shielding or deshielding of electrons. So basically, if the electronic state of the nucleus changes significantly, you're going to see a significant chemical shift. The more, the more it changes, the more shift. That makes sense, right? So if you look here, how much does my, my electronic state of the C1 carbon change when I you know, change that function? Not really that much, right? I mean, this whole part of the compound is essentially, I mean, this, this half of the compound is, is identical. It's going to change, yeah, maybe a little bit, but it's not going to change a lot. Whereas over here on this carbon, going from a, an NH2 group to an OH, those have very different electronic properties. Um, and so you're going to see a big change in the electronic state, certainly here, but also you know, on this carbon that's very close by. That makes sense, right, more or less? That's, that's why the site, that's why the carbon that you label is very important in all this. So, so there we go. Okay, let's go back here. Uh, the other thing too is molecular weight. T1 is very much dependent on the molecular weight. And for, for all the stuff that we do, the larger your compound gets, the higher the molecular weight, the shorter your T1s are gonna get. And T1 is very unforgiving as the compound gets bigger and bigger. So smaller is better. Um, yeah, at least for small, for small molecules. Okay, chemical properties, then you wanna know these things too. Um, so first of all, is this thing a liquid at room temperature? Remember, that's what pyruvic acid is. It's, it's a liquid at room temperature. That makes life a lot easier for you. Okay, if it's not, if it's a solid, then um, what's its water solubility? You know, most, most biological compounds are water soluble, but you know, that, that may. You know, that may vary. Um, and maybe you look at, is it, you know, is it known to be soluble in, in other solvents? That's a very good starting point. Um, another big one is ionization properties. So why would this matter? If something's water soluble, it doesn't, may not be very, uh, may not be very soluble. It might be somewhat soluble, but not, you know, not, not good enough for hyperpolarized. If you can ionize the compound, that introduces net charge, and then it gets much more soluble in water. Um, you know, so having something with a plus one, plus two, minus one, minus two charge, uh, you can you can stuff more of that in a in a in water. Um, and then, as we mentioned, stability is important too. Um, you know, just to have maybe a basic idea of this, and at least have it on hand. Um, you know, so this is you know, take notes. You know, research, research, research. You know, they say forget it's like a day in the library saves a, a month in the lab or something like that uh, you know so it's a good way to start okay then uh, we'll go over this a little more I think when we get to the lab but um, generally the first thing that you do when you're designing a new formulation tr first try to maximize the concentration um, you just get it as concentrated as possible um, you know forget about yeah, I don't know anything else just get super super concentrated then test the glassing oh shoot I said we were going to see this in lab. Well, we are going to see it in lab, but um, I guess as a spoiler, the, the testing glass involves liquid nitrogen. Um, uh, if it doesn't glass, which we'll see that in lab, I can't spoil that, um, then start adding some glassing agents. It's going to dilute the, the, the formulation. You know, it's not going to be as highly concentrated. That's a bummer, but um, it hopefully will glass. You know, try to add a minimum amount of glassing agent you know, and you can keep trying to see if it glasses um, and then stop once it glasses. And then, you know, you can make sure that your radical gets in and you're done. Is there a good rule of thumb there? Like in terms of, you know, if you have a highly concentrated water mm -hmm. and, you want, and you need to add glycerol or DMSO, 
there like a, a, a ratio that you want to shoot for? Good question. Um, actually, I think the amount of glassing agent you add, I think depends quite a bit upon how much you've already dissolved in the water. Um, so, you know, the more concentrated, actually, more concentrated formulations also tend to glass better. So that's not, it's not a hard and fast rule. Um, as far as how much glycerol to add, um, yeah, I think it's just sort of more like an experimental thing. However, you know, yeah, you have to test it. However, most preps that you see in the literature, if there's glycerol added, it's a 50-50 glycerol water prep, like 50-50 volume ratio. Um, that's a lot of people like that one. Um, so, but, you know, I mean, it all depends on, uh, you know, it all depends on what you test. Um, and if, you know, if you really want, you know, you can take a, you can take a formulation of a compound from the literature, and, you know, try tweaking it, play with it a little bit. We've certainly done that a lot um, here. So, and then uh, if, you, if you ever have any cool formulations uh, that you, you know, once, once, once you get them published, send them my way, because we actually keep a repository at UCSF of all these formulations. Uh, as part of the part of this uh, uh, HMTRC initiative, where we're a sort of a hyperpolarized center, we try to, you know, tell everyone our secrets, because we do things real good around here. Okay, um, now this is actually going beyond the formulation. Um, once you have the compound formulated, you want to test the T1 of it, and then the pol I guess the polarizability. You know, basically, what what percentage polarization do you get? So this is what I suggest. When you first start with an agent, use the use the non-enriched, um, and then add you know I don't say like maybe a little more radical, 20 millimolar, um, and you can actually go a long way with that. You can do a lot of testing here. Um, you can polarize you know 50 to 100 microliters of it. Um, you're not going to be able to sweep it because the signal is going to be very low. It's C12 instead of C13, but you can, you know, just guess, say maybe it's pyruvate treatments and polarize in the hypersense and then dissolve it and then see if you get any signal. This has actually worked quite well. Um, and it, use, use a larger tip angle, you know, sample a little more heavily on it. This is a great way of getting preliminary data for a compound, um, you know, because if you see signal, um, especially in the, you know, when it's not C13 enriched, that's a great sign that, that you know, that this will work, that you're going to get something that works. Um, you can also measure the T1s, so, you know, so you get those two, you can get that parameter as well, um, and very quickly have a sense of, you know, how, how well is this, is this compound going to work? Um, uh, and then, you know, pay, pay close attention to those peaks, to the spectra that you see, um, it, it, I, I, I very much think that um, sometimes unidentified peaks can in fact lead to new discoveries in this field. They have in fact, I can cite a couple examples, one of them being my own. Um, and you know, and look at those T1 values as well, you know, get, get, get to know your compound, get to know your prep. Um, and then once, once you've verified that your compound, it has decent signal, you at least see it in a hyperpolarized spectrum. And that the T1 is acceptable, again, maybe 30 seconds or, or less, depending on what you're going for, then you can drop some money for the C13 label compound. Those tend to be quite expensive. Um, alternatively, you can find some, some very talented um, uh, you know, synthetic chemists to try and make some for you, but you know, that might take a little longer, potentially. So um, anyway, so that's you know, kind of just more along a, you know, practical lines as far as experimental stuff goes. Okay. Um, so let's move on. Let's say that you, you know, you have a prep and you want to measure the polarization of it. By the way, this is the, the protocol that we use routinely in the bio-NMR lab. So we, we formulate, in the lab, we formulate uh, pyruvic acid and urea for all users, you know, so you can basically, you know, you sort of, you know, you take tubes and, you know, put down your, your, uh, what do you call it, your speed types so that we charge it to you, all that fun stuff. Um, but Anyway, you know, we, we, we make this stuff in large batches uh, and then aliquot it out. Well, before we aliquot it, we test it to make sure that, that you know, the polarization is good. So these are the same steps. Measure the polarization. So first, okay, formulate it. Great. Uh, this is with the C13 compound, by the way. So first, what you should do is you should sweep it um, on the polarizer. We talk, uh, Jeremy talked about that last time. Identify the, the microwave frequency that gives you the biggest signal. Um, it shouldn't be too far off from pyruvate. Typically not. Um, 
I haven't seen anything personally further away than like, I think 20 megahertz, 0 0.02, yeah, 0 0.02 gigahertz. I don't know, something like that. Of course, assuming you're using the trital radical. Um, and then, you know, polarize a bit of it, 20, 50 microliters um, on the same polarizer. And then you can dissolve it and measure, just, just do dynamic spectroscopy. Every three seconds, play a five degree, or if you like, you know, something up to 20 degree tip angle. Um, and then, you know, you'll get a time curve of spectra. I should have put something like that on the slide. I didn't. But what you can do from the time series is you can calculate the T1, uh, you know, make sure it should, hopefully it's similar to what you got on the C12, shouldn't change too much. The important thing though, is you should also use what's known as tip angle correction, especially if you're using the higher tip angles, like 20 degrees, and especially if you're, you're taking more, more time points. Um, what tip angle correction does is it accounts for the fact that each, each subsequent spectrum you have lower signal, not just from T1, but also because you applied the tipping. You remember in hyperpolarized, every time we play um, an excitation pulse, we steal, so we snag some of the magnetization and it doesn't come back. So you have to correct for that uh, when, you're, when you're calculating your T1 to be uh, more effective, uh, or sorry, I should say more, more accurate. So anyway, um, then what, we'll, what, what we do in order to measure the percent polarization, um, basically the way to do that for a hyperpolarized uh, experiment is, um, as we talked about a bit, you don't know, you, you know, so hyperpolarized is not, it's not absolutely quantitative because the hyperpolarized state is constantly sort of, it's, it, it's depolarized. But to measure your percent polarization, you can do that by comparing um, say your first hyperpolarized time point signal with, you know, with a measurement of known polarization. Um, Jeremy showed actually on the bottom right this uh, this equation PT equals hyperbolic tangent of one half h bar gamma b naught over kBT. That's the that's the the um, equation for calculating polarization based on temperature, nucleus, and uh, and the the field. Which means that if you have a spectrometer, say like the 500 megahertz spectrometer we have in the lab, you can know what the carbon polarization is just by calculating it. You just throw in the temperature, throw in you know, all those values, and you can calculate it. Um, that means that if you acquire a, a standard NMR spectrum on carbon at that spectro on that spectrometer, you can reference your hyperpolarized spectrum on the same spectrometer to that to that what we call thermal spectrum. And by you know, calculating the ratio you know, of those two, you can get the enhancement and then you can calculate the polarization. Hopefully that makes some sense, but I guess the bottom line is your hyperpolarized polarization measure with reference to a known polarization, what we call the thermal polarization, the non-polarized. So, and that's something that we do routinely in the lab. And if you ever have questions on that, you can ask me. Um, there may, I'm sure there are other users as well in this room who have done, uh, done this kind of thing. Um, so, so anyway, um, uh, yeah, I'll leave that at that. Um, a good percent polarization value, um, I won't talk too much right now about that calculator. You can ask me later, but a good value I'd say is like greater than 15%. You know, if you're if you're doing that, that's that's pretty good. Remember, the max is a hundred percent, but we never get there. So, okay, great. Um, everything I just said is basically what we do for, um, as I mentioned, you know, when we when we formulate compounds for lab use, you know, we um, we then we make sure that you know that the polarizations and the T ones all are within spec. What we what we um, what we typically get so that, you know, we don't have a bunch of users using, you know, poorly formulated pyruvic acid and it compromises their, their data. So, so anyway, um, one important thing we can mention, and this could be useful for you as you're formulating your own compounds is uh, by paying close attention to the buildup curve in the polarizer, what we call the solid state buildup. Um, we're looking at, you know, uh, solution state T1s, the solution pH, uh, things like that. Um, you know, by, by paying close attention to these things, you might be able to pin down, did you add too much radical? Did you add too much gadolinium dota? Do you need to adjust these numbers? 
Um, and so, you know, this is all part of part of the or part of all that. Um, I'm not going to go into this extra stuff. Um, there's just a lot of, you know, this is more just kind of a literature review of various things you can do in order to, um, uh, you know, to improve preps. And it works on all sides. You can you can modify the hyperpolaris agent itself by using a precursor. Uh, deuteration improves T1s. Uh, you can use different radicals. You can use removable radicals. Um, there's all kinds of fun stuff. In that side. Um, some people are also, you know, have tested what happens if you C13 labeled a solvent. Um, what happens if you, uh, if you freeze your sample not in helium, which is what, you know, when you insert into the polarizer and you know, the helium freezes your sample, what if you freeze it in isopentane? And what they found is you can actually get rid of the glassing agents. So you got some kind of fun stuff there. Um, uh, so anyway, um, you know, I, I, I'm sorry I don't have time to really go into all this because um, we have to head over, I think, very soon. And I want to leave uh, time for, for questions and that sort of stuff. But um, I guess the, the basic point is there's still a lot going on in this, um, even though I think I haven't done a very good look recently. Um, and then modifying the electron relaxation agents. Uh, in fact, Jeremy actually um, uh, has done, a, it did some of, the, some of the first work in uh, holmium doing, which he found doesn't uh, relax C13 as much, but you still, it still seems to relax the radical just as well. So you get similar percent polarization gains as gadolinium. So all kinds of fun stuff there. Um, I'm just gonna wrap up here. So formulating, it's an essential part of this. Um, and a lot of it is, 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 is an art, um, you know, which is why I sort of started by, you know, Kind of joking, it's almost like potions class, you know. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's, there's, it's certainly scientific, but it's complicated. So a lot of it's just guess and check, really. But with but educated guessing. Um, and some people have said, well, maybe we need more scientific rigor. We can look at some of these things a little more uh, you know, scientifically, and it'll be interesting to see in the future how this might change. You know, there may be new paradigms for formulation. Um, some people have talked about, can you can you polarize a powder? instead of a, a frozen sample or, you know, a frozen liquid? Um, that's a great question. I'm excited to see if that ever, you know, flies. Um, and as the polarization technology changes, dissolution DNP is only one of them. I mean, right now it's kind of the main, the main act in town, the only thing you can do clinically, but, you know, who knows what's gonna happen in the next, you know, 10, 20 years. We might see some of these other new polarization tech technologies uh, rise up. And that means that we're gonna be preparing compounds differently. So. At the same time, I think the, the principle will still apply. Um, biocompatibility is very important, which is why it's great to be here at UCSF, because you work with people who have a good sense. Uh, and one person I could particularly name drop, drop would be Jim Slater, who's been working a lot on getting new formulations into, into the spin lab and ultimately into patients. A lot of this also borrows from pharmaceutical research. Um, you know, excipients are those, you know, those additional agents that get added to drug formulations, be they, you know, injected uh, intravenously, like in our case, or, you know, or swallowed in a pill. Um, I think the IV excipients are most important for us. But um, so again, I think just to point out that there are a lot of different fields of research, a lot of different uh, areas where people are thinking along the same lines as we should be. So. So anyway, um, yeah, I encourage you to just keep, keep on top of the literature, you know, look at, look at various things. And because uh, again, you know, uh, there, there are compounds that have great biological rationale should be able to fly. But our biggest concern right now is we just can't formulate it properly. So there's a lot of work to be done here and a lot of creativity, I think, to be had. So hopefully I've convinced you that there's a lot to it and, uh, you know, and, and you can have a lot of fun along the way. So um, that's all I got. Happy prep making. Uh, I can take any quick questions before we head to the lab. Great. Okay. Um, that's it. Then we'll we'll meet on the third floor um, in BH three hundred and four in the first. Uh, what do you call it? The first. Um, for the first bay, thank you, yeah. So closest to the kitchen. All right, uh, and we'll get to see some fun stuff like blasting. We'll go through an example formulation together just to kind of think through it. A lot of good things going on there, so.
Great. Okay. And I'm going to end the, the share here. Thank you very much. And let's stop recording.